Am I on? Am I on now? Good morning, everybody. I hope y'all are doing well today. So good to uh, see you all gathered together. Uh, so good to know that uh, there are those of you in the fellowship hall. We are glad that you are here as well. Hope you all are having a wonderful Sunday morning. Uh, I was greeted once again with a nice, cool, crisp morning as I left the house and got in the car and rode to church with the windows down. Uh, just a good fallish feeling morning, but as Tracy said, that will not last long because it is July, so the heat's on the way. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and be turning to Mark chapter 9, where we'll be this morning. We'll finish up the, the, the chapter of Mark chapter 9, and perhaps you're wondering why in the midst of all this I haven't deviated from Mark. I haven't gone away from Mark to talk about something else, maybe how to respond in a crisis, or uh, how to trust God when things are, are difficult, or uh, what does Pastor Ben think about the state of the world, or not that anybody cares about that, but... One of the reasons why I haven't left the study of Mark is because I think whatever's going on in the world, God has purposes for us as we move through his word verse by verse. We set about to study this book, and God put this book together on purpose in the order that he did, and the stories come on purpose in the order that they do. And by his grace, in his sovereign control of these things, we have been able to address a lot of stuff that's going on in the world, even as we have moved through this ancient biography of Jesus. So I trust the Bible enough to know that God has purpose for us today in Mark chapter 9, verses 38 through 50. It'll apply to our hearts individually. Several of you over the last few weeks have told me just how God is using his word in your life, and praise God for that. He'll use this word in our lives individually in ways that I don't even know things that are going on in your life. He'll use it in our lives corporately as a gathered church. And that's just what God does with his word. And I find that just to be amazing. But if you got your Bible open to Mark chapter 9 and you're able to stand, I'll invite you to stand as we read from the word of God. We'll pick up reading in verse 38. Mark chapter 9, verse 38 said, and John said to him, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. We tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, do not stop him for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gains, gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Whoever causes one of the little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves be at peace with one another. Let's pray. Father God, we have gathered on this Sunday, this Lord's Day, and we have gathered because it is right, it is good, it is, we have gathered because we need it. And so Father, we pray that you would come now and open your word to our hearts and our minds, help us to understand these things, help us Lord to uh, deal with them, apply them to our hearts in the very specific ways in which we need them. Lord, convict us of sin, call us to righteousness. Father, we pray all of these things in your name. Amen. You may be seated. So let me make a couple of remarks right up front. Uh, number one, this is kind of a strange part of Mark. 
it's almost like he had, as he was writing his story, he had these other pieces, these other sayings from Jesus, and he's trying to figure out, where do I put these in the story? And so he thought, well, the end of chapter 9 seems to work real well, so I'll just stick them in here. So there's kind of these three sayings that don't make a whole lot of sense put together. There's the, saying, or there's the issue about the exorcism, the don't cause other people to sin, and then if you sin, cut your hands off. So they don't seem at first to go together. So I hope in God's grace and through the opening of our eyes by the Holy Spirit that we'll see that I think they fit together quite nicely. But something else I want to make a comment about because you may have either wondered just now as we were reading it or maybe you've wondered this before. If you are reading an English version that's not the King James, then you probably notice that verses 44 and 46 are missing. It goes straight from 43 to 45 and straight from 45 to 47. Now, that's not, that does not mean that your Bible is missing any verses. My Bible is missing those as well. Now, this is not part of the sermon, but I do want to address this because it's helpful when we learn how to read the Bible. Now, we have our English translations based on gr- the original Greek copies. So when, when they sat down to write the Greek copies, they've translated it over the centuries, and that's where we have our Bibles from. And thankfully, we have thousands and thousands of copies of those original Greek manuscripts, those original Greek pieces of, of parchment that the Bible was originally written on. And so we take all of those and we compare them, and the consensus is what we have. And by God's grace, that's what we have. Now, the King James Version of the Bible was written or translated in 1611 by King James. Now, at that time, that was the most accurate English translation. And so the verses 45 or 44 and 46 were in there. Now, if you're wondering, are you missing something? What verses 45 or 44 and 46 say are what we have in verse uh, 48 where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. That's just repeated three times in the King James Version. Now, since 1611, we have found more copies of the Bible. Anybody heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Heard of that? That's part of, we have found earlier copies than what the King James was based on. That doesn't mean the King James is bad. It's not a bad translation. But what we found is some of those earlier copies didn't have that repetition, if that makes sense. So I just, if I have confused you at all, I understand. I know that this may be totally new to some of y'all. And if you want to talk about this at length, I'll be happy to hang around afterwards. But I just wanted to address, this is one of those parts in our Bible that it may trip you up if I didn't speak to it. So it's not that the Bible is missing anything. All the substance is there. Everything that God wanted to say is there. And it's trustworthy what we have here in front of us. Now, now that that's out of the way, if you have questions, like I said, we can talk about that afterwards. And we'll come back to this uh, as we move through Mark. But if you got your notes, you can see there that the main idea that I want us to deal with this morning is that following Jesus is costly and demanding. And it is. To become a disciple of Jesus Christ is costly and demanding, but rejecting Jesus costs more. It's it's costly, it's demanding to follow Jesus, but it costs more to reject Jesus. Sometimes we think we reject Jesus because I don't I don't want to follow that strongly. I don't want to I don't want to deal with sin. I don't want to give up some of these pleasures that I have. That's some of the reasons why the world rejects Jesus or why we in moments of sin will reject the truth of Jesus. And yet Jesus tells us here in this text that rejecting him is far more costly than any of the demands he puts on us. So we'll begin this morning where I will bring the sermon to an end. It's by saying this. Jesus tells us that we ultimately are to be consecrated to God. That means presented to God as a holy sacrifice. We're to be presented to God and to live out the gospel. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's what it means to be salted with fire. That's what it means to have salt in ourselves and be at peace with one another. That's the final thing he says here in chapter 9. Have salt in yourselves, be at peace with one another. And what he's saying is, And I hope this will become clear as we move through the sermon. What he's saying is, 
We are to be given totally to God. We are to let the Holy Spirit do the work of, of making us more and more like Jesus. And we are to live out the peace of God in our lives. You see, that's the greatness of the kingdom of God. I said last week we started talking about this issue of greatness. The disciples are having this discussion of who's the greatest. And Jesus is correcting them. And it bleeds over into this. This is part of the same story, part two, if you will. And so Jesus says, it's not about being great like you're thinking about being great. He says, it's about lowliness. It's about being a servant of all. It's about being presented to God as holy and living out the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Jesus gives us three requirements. Now, there's a lot more requirements when it comes to, if we were going to make an exhaustive list of what it, means to be, what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, we'd have to get a lot of sheets of paper out. But right here, he, he summarizes in three requirements. Now, these requirements are just that. They are required, but they're also common stumbling blocks for us. So Jesus is dealing very much with just our normal being humans. He knows where we struggle. He knows what trips us up. He knows about Tuesday afternoon when I'm not, when I'm not trying to be holy. I, you know, we try to be holy on Sundays, but come Tuesday or Wednesday afternoon, we're running out of gas. And Thursday, we're gone. He knows about our everyday life struggles. And so these requirements speak to those things. And the first one is this. Don't be cliquish. Don't be tribalistic. And let me explain what I mean by that. If you've ever heard of a clique or you've been in a group of people and you say there's a clique, what we mean is there's this exclusive, smaller group of people that you can't become a part of. It's hard to get in. They don't let new folks in the group. That's what, that's what a clique is. It's this special, exclusive group that it's really hard to get into. Now, teenagers can be known for cliques. And sometimes I think we can forget that it's not just teenagers that can be known for cliques. Adults are just as bad. Sometimes I, I think we forget that teenagers aren't the only ones who do this. We expect it of teenagers sometimes, but I think adults do it probably far more often. Cliques are not only closed, but they are unwelcoming. They don't want people coming into the group. We don't want you to come in. We've got our own thing. We've got our own culture. We do it our way. So just stay out. So Jesus says to his disciples, don't be cliquish. Now we see this with the, with the interaction with the exorcist. Look at verse 38. John said to him, this is the apostle John, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him for he was not following us. So it comes up as they're talking about greatness. They're probably still in the house. If you remember back last week, they had gone into a house and Jesus had brought the child in there. So they're probably still sitting there in that circle. And it comes up that there was this exorcist and he was casting out demons in Jesus's name. Now the implication, what, what Mark wants us to understand is this guy was not part of the disciples. Now we know up until this point, based on what Mark's told us, Jesus can cast out demons. And there was at least a limited amount of time where the disciples were given the power to cast out demons in chapter six. They went out on mission and they cast out demons. Nobody else that Mark has told us has the power to do that. But here, John says, Jesus, we came up on this guy and he was using your name and casting out demons. Now, the way Mark wrote this in the Greek language, it would tell us that he's not just trying to cast out demons. He was being successful. He was actually casting out demons. Now, what's sad and comical about this is just a few verses ago, Jesus is coming down the mountain of transfiguration, and what does he find his disciples doing? Arguing because they couldn't cast out a demon. But that didn't keep them, brothers and sisters, that didn't keep them, their failure didn't keep them from saying, well, just because we couldn't do it doesn't mean you can. You don't have permission. Even though you're succeeding where we failed, you're not of us. 
You're not one of us. You don't have the title disciple. You're not following Jesus. You haven't been commissioned like we have. And so they rebuked him. It says we tried to stop him. He was not following us. Now notice, notice they didn't say you. We tried to stop him, Jesus, because he wasn't following you. What'd they say? They use that personal plural pronoun, us, we, the group. They weren't following the group. So that, that, little, that one little word, brothers and sisters, gives us some insight into their minds that still aren't working. Because back here in verses 33 through 37, when they're talking about greatness, who's the greatest? Who's going to take over Jesus when you go to, to die? Who's going to be elevated? They're still thinking that they have some kind of privilege. Because they don't say, Jesus, he's not following you. They say, Jesus, he's not following us. So they've got this idea of privilege and prestige in their mind. But Jesus rebukes them. Verse 39, Jesus said, don't stop him. Now imagine, you, you have in all your self-righteousness have decided that this guy is breaking the law. He's doing something wrong. He's not, fo- he's not of your group, even though he's being successful in what he's doing, he's not following your group. And so you, you walk up to him and you tell him, you quit that. And you come back to Jesus your chest poked out, shirt tucked in. You are proud to say, Jesus, we rebuked him. He's not one of us. And then Jesus says, well, you shouldn't have done that. He says, all, that, all that pride just kind of goes away. All that pride is now like mud on your face. Because what you thought was a point to brag about, Jesus says, well, that's actually just humiliating for you. You are the one in the wrong. He says, don't stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. He's saying, look, if he's doing something good, if he's doing good work, if it's clear that God is blessing him, which brothers and sisters, we don't have the power in and of ourselves to cast out demons. Even if we just decided, I'm gonna use Jesus' name. It's not, Jesus' name is not some kind of magical incantation, not some kind of spell. In order for the power of God to be released, guess who has to release it? God. So guess who released power in the moment when this unnamed man cast out the demons? It was God. God cast out this demon using this unnamed man. And so Jesus is saying, look, just because, just because somebody's out of step with you, just because somebody's outside of your group, just because somebody's doing something differently than you might think ought to be done, if God is blessing it, then it's okay. Let me apply some modern application to this. Methodists are Christians too. Presbyterians are Christians too. Other denominations are Christians too. Baptists don't have a corner on the Christian market. It's not ranked in God's eyes about which denomination is our better Christians. Now, we could say that Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians, uh, Anglicans, uh, some Catholics... There are, there are genuine believers in all of these denominations, and yet we obey to various degrees. Sometimes Methodists are more obedient in one thing, where Baptists are more obedient in another. But Jesus is saying, don't get so caught up in this group identity that you miss what God is doing elsewhere. Anybody ever been in here to the, uh, or in the fellowship hall, I can't see you in there, but anybody ever been to a Southern Baptist convention? It happens once a year. All right, we got one. It's two of us. Uh, a couple of us. All right. So the Southern Baptist, this is the first year since uh, World War II, I think. It's only the second time in the history of the Southern Baptist Convention that we aren't having one. But every year, typically, the convention gathers, and at some point, usually on the second day, somebody gives what's called the, the, the convention sermon. It's kind of an honor, honor to be invited to give the convention sermon. 
Well, in 1948, a guy named Bill Leonard gave the convention sermon. And essentially, here, here was his point, all right? At the 1948 Southern Baptist Convention, given the convention sermon, Bill Leonard said, God needs the Southern Baptist Convention to carry out the Great Commission. God can't do it without Southern Baptist. Now, that's embarrassing. Bill Leonard was a, a faithful pastor. Bill Leonard was a good, uh, a, a good person as far as we can be good. Bill Leonard was a faithful shepherd, and yet in this moment, he was violating Mark chapter 9. He was saying, Southern Baptists have something that the other denominations don't. And that's not true. Jesus is saying here, don't disregard. Don't think yourself so great that you put yourself above other believers. Believers of other traditions, believers of other practices, or the like. Jesus is saying that God works in many people and in many ways. So rather than quarreling over petty things, we should recognize our true partners in ministry. If somebody comes up to you as you're laboring for the Lord and said, hey, here's a cup of cold water. Jesus says, take the water. If you see somebody who is an Anglican, and you may not know much about the Anglican denomination, but if you see somebody who's an Anglican and they're evangelizing somebody in a way that you might not evangelize, but that person comes to faith, we stand back and say, praise God. Jesus says greatness doesn't quarrel, doesn't argue over these things. Greatness, greatness celebrates the goodness and the work of God however he sees fit. No one person, no one church has any superiority in the kingdom of God. And so Jesus says, look, Fellas, don't be cliquish. Don't be like this. But then he goes on and says, don't, don't cause other people to sin. Don't think yourself so good that you're exclusive, but also don't cause other people to sin. Look at verse 42. It says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he went or he were thrown into the sea. That's kind of hard to read. If you let that sink in on you, that's hard to read. Because this isn't just anyone talking. This is Jesus talking. Now, let's try to figure out what he's saying. He says, little ones. If whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin... Now, in the actual language of how Mark is writing, this ties us back to verse 37, which we talked about last week when he pulled a, quote, little one into the midst of those disciples. He pulled a child in. And if you remember, he said, unless you become like a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And we said that that doesn't mean that we are, have a childlike faith or that we're childish in our faith. What that meant was that we become low in the social order that we become entirely dependent on God, that our decision-making is God's alone, not on ours. And so Jesus is going back to that, to that idea. If we, that is other Christians, he's talking to the disciples, if we cause another Christian to sin, Jesus said it, it would be better for us to have a millstone. Now, Y'all might know what a millstone is. The uh, 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 Farm implement, if you will, big, heavy stone that would roll around and crush grain. It would be attached to a donkey. The donkey would be attached to the, to the mechanism. He'd just walk in a circle. And that millstone weighed thousands of pounds. And so the, the, the image here is unmistakable. There's no swimming with a millstone on your neck. It would be akin to having a car tied around your neck. Now, what does he mean by sin? What does he mean by stumble? What he's not saying is, if in any particular instance, even one time you call somebody to sin, as bad as that is, we should go out of our way to make sure we never give anybody any reason to sin. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. When he says sin or stumble, what he's talking about is leading another believer to stumble in their faith, as in doubt their faith. He's talking about causing another believer to fall away. 
He's talking about leading a believer to pursue something that's not the kingdom of God. Jesus tells us, seek first the kingdom of God and all God's righteousness will be added to you. Leading someone astray in, 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 verses 40, in verse 42 means that we lead somebody, we teach somebody to value something more than God's kingdom. Now, how might this happen? Because if you're, if, you're, if you're like me, my first thought is I would never do this. But how does this happen? Well, one, it happens through our own sinfulness. It happens through our own hypocrisy. If we aren't dealing with our own sin, which we'll talk about in just a moment, if we aren't dealing with our own sin, if we are entertaining sin in our life, then other people see that. And if they see us not dealing with our own sins, then that's leading them to do the same. Hypocrisy is huge in the American religious world. There are a startling number of men and women in my generation. Now, I'm part of what's called the millennial generation. And there are all kinds of generational studies you can read about how fancy the millennials are. And I use that word in a negative way. But there is a startling testimony among men and women of my generation that say they have left the church because of how they saw their parents live out the gospel. They say, they're saying, I have no interest in organized religion. I have no interest in the church because of what I saw mom and dad do. And this is what verse 42 is talking about. Jesus is saying, don't be a hypocrite because hypocrisy leads people away. Don't be a Sunday Christian. Now, the temptation here for anybody who's teaching this verse is to make it softer because it it is hard hitting like just you're unaware you're not ready for anything and then out of nowhere somebody punches you right in the gut that's what it feels like and the temptation is to say but it's not really that bad and yet Jesus means what he says he says it would be better if I died a quick death by drowning than to lead someone to fall away, than to be the cause of someone leaving the faith, giving someone reason to doubt. How else might that happen? It happens in our decision-making. Think about how you choose to go about your life. I'm not talking about the individual decisions. I'm talking about those big principles that guide big decisions. Do they originate from here? Or do they originate from here? Our decision-making, if they're not based in Scripture, will be based somewhere, probably based in the world, probably based in worldly wisdom. And then our decision-making, brothers and sisters, if we are not tied to Scripture, we can unintentionally lead people away. Questions are, will we honor God or honor ourselves? What about when you give advice? Maybe your child comes to you for advice or a family member or a friend. Do you give advice that comes from the Bible? Or do you give advice that makes sense in the moment? Or do you give advice that keeps them out of trouble? Sometimes obeying and following Jesus gets us into trouble rather than out of trouble. Sometimes following what the Bible lays out, the path that the Bible lays out is harder than what worldly wisdom would tell us particularly when it comes to dealing with sin. The world would just say, don't deal with that. Ignore it. Brush it under the rug. And yet Jesus says, it's got to be dealt with. Jesus says, don't cause other people, don't cause other Christians to sin. Don't be cliquish. Don't cause people to sin. And then the third one. He says, battle your own sin at all costs. Battle your own sin at all costs. Look at verse 43. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. Now here again, Jesus is using some very graphic language. The the image of a hand getting cut off 
or a foot getting cut off or an eye getting torn out that gets our attention and it's meant to get our attention. Can you imagine the disciples hearing this? Can you imagine you're sitting there with Jesus and he all of a sudden starts talking about cutting your own hand off, cutting your own foot off, tearing your eye out? You might be tempted to think, this is not what I signed up for. This is not what I had in mind, Jesus, when you said, follow me. And yet Jesus is very clear. He is making his point. Sin is not worth it. Whatever you can do to get rid of sin in your life is worth it. Now, two things to say. Number one, Jesus isn't speaking literally. He's not saying that if you cause someone to sin, go find a millstone and throw yourself in the lake. That's not what he's saying. And he's not saying, if you notice, unbeknownst to you, that your hand is over here sinning, cut it off. He's not saying, take a knife and cut it off, right? Because the hand only does what the heart wants. The eye only looks at what the heart wants. So ultimately, cutting off a hand or a foot or tearing out an eye solves nothing. But his point is, there is no, there, there, there's, there, there's no going too far to deal with sin. You can't fight against your sin enough. We can never get too comfortable with saying, all right, I've dealt with enough of my sin. I'm good now. Now, even though Jesus isn't speaking literally here, we have to avoid that temptation of making it softer again. Because we want to say, well, Jesus just means, you know, we just, we just need to be aware. Jesus just means we need to not sin as much. Listen to this quote. We prefer to soften the harshness of guilt, get rid of the fear of hell, live in peaceful compromise with the world. Jesus, however, chose deliberately harsh, scandalous imagery to alert the disciples that their lives tremble in the balance. Now, I can't communicate to you strong enough what Jesus is saying here. I can't communicate to myself strong enough. It's got to be the power of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus is using this kind of language to remind us, this is not some kind of board game. This is life and death. This is the single most important aspect of what it means to be alive on the world, in the world. To be a human being means to be made in the image of God, means to be fallen into sin, means to be a rebel against God apart from Jesus Christ. And unless we have salvation in his name, we we will be damned to hell. I don't consider myself a hellfire brimstone preacher, but this is a hellfire brimstone text. And Jesus is saying this is a legitimate life and death issue. So take Notice, Jesus is saying, if we are indifferent to other people, that is, if we're indifferent to how our lives affect others, if we don't care what kind of effect we're having on other people, if we're leading them to sin, if we lack care about our own sins, if that's our attitude and approach to life, Jesus is saying our salvation is being put in question because that's not how Christians live We must not miss Jesus' alarm. Now, don't forget, he's not preaching publicly right now. He's talking to these 12. And by God's grace, he's talking to every Christian, every disciple that would come after. These harsh statements about cutting off and tearing out are followed by the reality of hell. He doesn't just say, deal with your sin because it's bad. He says, deal with your sin because hell is on the other side. It's almost this either or. Deal with your sin or hell. Cut off the hand or go to hell. Tear out the eye or go to hell. Losing a hand or a foot or an eye sounds entirely unattractive. I have no desire to lose my hand or my foot or my eye. But when faced with the prospect of eternal death, when faced with the prospect of eternal dying, 
A hand is nothing. When faced with the prospect of being rejected by God into the eternal torment of hell, where he says the worm doesn't die and the fire isn't quenched, take it all. Cut it all off. And yet, no one would choose to enter hell as opposed to heaven. If we sat somebody down and said, hell is real, heaven is real, which one do you want to go to? Nobody would willingly choose to go to hell. But this is how so many people are living. If we sat people down and said, here are the two realities. If you go to heaven, it's going to be with an injury. If you go to hell, it's going to be whole. Which one do you want? If we're all in our right minds, we would think, I'll choose heaven. Injure me however bad you need to as long as I get to heaven. And yet what the Bible tells us is that we are not in our right minds. Sin has broken our minds. We don't think straightly. We don't think clearly. We live as if this reality is just not there. We act like we can keep pet sins like a dog. If you, some of y'all have a dog or a cat or some kind of pet. We act like we can keep sins like that. We look good on the outside, but we keep these sins tucked away on the inside that nobody but us or maybe just a few of us know about. But it's like keeping a pet fire amidst really dry brush. You can't do that. I can't do that. There's no such things as pet sins. There's just rejection of Jesus. And so he says if... You find that to be the case, cut the hand off, cut the foot off, tear the eye out. Don't stop until the sin is dealt with. So then he uses this phrase, verse 49. Everyone will be salted with fire. Now, this is a new favor for me. I'm gonna adopt this language for the rest of my life. Sometimes you just read things and it just gets cemented into your mind. This is one of those phrases because when I read it, I thought, what does that mean? Salted with fire. That's the application this morning. We're going to be, if we are believers in Jesus Christ, we're going to be salted with fire. Now I said I'm going to begin the sermon where we're going to end it, and that's by saying that Jesus is ultimately saying to us as his followers, we are to be totally given to God, we're to be consecrated to God, and to live out the salvation of the gospel. Now, this phrase, salted with fire, is rooted way back deep in the Old Testament. It's almost a quote from Leviticus chapter 2, verse 13, where God giving the law to the priest about bringing sacrifices to be burned, he says to the priest, you will salt that sacrifice with the salt of God's covenant promises before you burn it. You're going to put covenant salt on the sacrifice and then burn it. Now, that's not so it would taste good to God. That's not, that's, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is that salt represents seasoning and preparation and purification. It's going to be seasoned. It's going to be purified before it goes into the sacrificial fire. Similar language we find in 1 Peter, where Peter, said, Peter talks about the tested genuineness of our faith. You know what that means? That our faith will be tested to make it genuine. Not tested to see if it fails, tested to make it genuine. And here, the, 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 the idea is that when we adopt the idea of lowliness in the kingdom of God, which Jesus has just been talking about, and pairing that with this idea of we're going to be refined, Jesus is going is to deal with us and deal with these ideas of clickishness. He's going to deal with these ideas of making other people sin. And he's going to deal with our tendency to hide our own sin. As we understand this idea of lowliness and as we become refined, that is made more like Jesus, we will come out as peaceful, wise people. That's why he says salt is good. Have salt in yourselves. Be at peace with one another. Let me say that again. As we are corrected in our ideas of greatness, 
That means when we understand that God calls us to be lowly, and that's paired with God refining us, then we will come out, we will be transformed into people that are wise according to the scriptures and people who live at peace with one another. So here's the two application points. Number one, disciples grow through hardship, becoming wise, peaceful people. Disciples grow through hardship, becoming wise, peaceful people. If disciples will take up their cross, if they will deny themselves, if they will follow Jesus through joy and hardship, the promise here is this. I want you to listen to me because here's the promise Jesus is making that will apply in very specific ways to all of you. The promise here is that if we'll take up our cross, deny ourselves and follow Jesus, that the suffering that we undergo will not destroy us, it will purify us. See, so many times, brothers and sisters, we enter into some period of suffering or hardship or worry or anxiety, and we think right off the bat, God, why would you bring this to me? And what Jesus is saying is he will transform us so much that when we enter those periods, we will say, God, I don't understand, but I know you're going to purify me. You're not going to lose me. You're not going to do me some kind of wrong. You're going to purify me. You're not gonna destroy me, you're purifying me. One of the benefits of being salted with fire is that we become people who give out that very salt. We become people who apply this wisdom and purification of God. We live out and establish the gospel. Think about your own relationships, all right? You all have family and friends. You all live with other people. Are your relationships genuinely peaceful? What I don't mean is, do y'all get along? Because angry people can get along. What I mean is, are your relationships genuinely peaceful? Because what Jesus is saying here is that, that as we are transformed, as God's peace gets worked out in us, we begin to work that peace out into other people. Philippians 4, it's a favorite quote for a lot of people, that the, 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 the surpassing peace of God, the peace that surpasses all understanding. We all want that, and we all think that God's just gonna zap it to us in a moment of hardship, but the idea here is different. The idea here is that as we grow in Christ's likeness, as we fight our own sin, as we deal with our own wrong ideas about what it means to be great, that peace is not something that we live without until we need it. That peace is something that we live out all the time. Are you a peaceful person? So disciples grow through hardship, becoming wise, peaceful people. But the second point is this. Those who claim Christ yet show no wisdom or peacefulness have great reason for concern. Those who claim Christ yet show no wisdom and no peacefulness in their life, Jesus is saying, you have great reason to be concerned about your soul. This is the second application of the salt. Verse 50, he says, salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? The point is, salt is used as a, as, as a um, the word left my mind, uh, to purify and to season. But if salt loses its essential quality, then it's useless. It won't season anything and it won't, save anything. And so Jesus is saying, if salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? The answer is you can't. If someone claims to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, but the, the, the distinctive characteristics that Jesus requires, if those things are not present in their lives, Jesus is saying, you're as worthless as salt that's lost its saltiness. If you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, but the, these things that the Bible says must be true of a believer, if they're not true of you, Jesus says there's great reason for concern. Now let me pause for a minute and just add a pastoral note. 
Jesus doesn't expect us to be perfect. Jesus isn't calling us to perfection. Jesus doesn't say, if you are not entirely peaceful with everybody all the time, then you're not a believer. That's not what he's saying. It's like this. If somebody comes up to you and tells you they're an astronaut, and you ask them, well, where'd you go to flight school? Well, I didn't go to flight school. Well, what branch of the military are you in? Well, I'm not in the military. Have you ever been to NASA or Houston? I don't know where those are. You ever flown? Nope. You would begin to question whether or not they were an astronaut. And the same principle applies here. Jesus is not saying doubt everybody all the time. Jesus is saying take an honest look at your life. He's saying these are, these are realities that are, that are true of the Christian. That we recognize we can be cliquish and that we shouldn't be. That if we're not careful, we will lead other people to sin and we can't do that. And third, we have to be fighting against our own sin. We can't be friends with our sins, brothers and sisters. And Jesus is saying, if those things aren't true of you, then you're basically like someone who claims to be an astronaut who isn't. We need not shy away from how hard this hits. There's three things Jesus has said that's hard hitting. Throw a millstone around your neck, cut off whatever's making you sin, and if you claim to be salt, but you've lost your saltiness, it's worthless. We need not shy away from those things. We need to be sobered by those things. Because it's not like somebody, random somebody is speaking. These, is, these are the words of Jesus Christ himself. I'm tempted to soften them because you all are looking at me like I'm saying them. I know you don't think I'm saying them. I, well, I trust you understand I'm not saying them. I'm tempted to soften them because I got to stand up here and look at you and say them. But these are the words of Jesus Christ himself, the one who says, take my yoke upon you because my burden is easy and the yoke is light. This is the one who says, there is no life apart from me. So brothers and sisters, we shouldn't shy away from these things. We should be sobered by these things. So let me invite you to bow your head, close your eyes. If you are a believer this morning, then you know and you have been reminded that following Jesus is costly. Following Jesus is costly. We're being called to give ourselves totally to God. We're being called to be purified and made holy, to be salted with fire. We're being called to put away values that the world teaches us. We're being called to guard ourselves and others against sin. We're being called to, to not be cliquish. And the honest reality is that following Jesus is hard and demanding. But rejecting Jesus is costlier. It costs more. So if you are a non-Christian, if you aren't of the faith. Know that while following Jesus is costly, neglecting him costs more. Speaking to both the one who rejects him outright and the one who is pretending to be a Christian. Jesus says, hell is a terrible place. Hell is a place Jesus uses the graphic language where the worm doesn't die and the fire does not go out. It is a place of God's righteous punishment forever. And Jesus is not trying to scare us here. He's not trying to terrify us. Jesus is making a plea that is as merciful as a plea can ever be recognize what stands before us. And so if you are a non-Christian who either rejects Christ or you're just pretending, I urge you to repent, to believe on his name and to follow him. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word and thank you, Lord, even for these hard texts 
Thank you for being so honest and so hard-hitting, Lord, even to awaken us when we are slumbering. Lord Jesus, come and deal with us now. Come and deal with us that we might be salted with fire, that we might be purified. Father, I pray that you'd bring conviction of sin. Father, I pray that you'd even bring salvation. Lord, we love you and we trust you and we pray all of these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. As Patty comes to lead us,